Thank you all. I'm going to try to do a very slow intro so that Josh and David can start eating. So I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he seemed me hungry. <laughs> I've, I've been to the house a few times. It's not a, not a pretty sight. Not a pretty sight. Well, thank you all for coming again to our second conversation about rising. Um, as, as you know, these are a series of conversations that we have with. Uh, local leaders, champions, and, and heroes in, in our community to talk about how they pursue the American dream. Uh, there are some truisms about the American dream that here, here at Boston Rising we've uncovered. Uh, in order to achieve the American dream, and we call it, it rising at Boston Rising, three things have to be in place. Um, access to social connections. And so we hope that when you came here, you had an opportunity to meet folks that you might have not met before, or you had an opportunity to meet new people or mix elbows with some of the staff here, or reconnect with old friends that you haven't seen before. So social connections is one of the ingredients for folks to pursue the American dream. It's who you know, it's how those people mentor you and guide you, and it's the connections that they, they make. The other truism about rising in America is access to jobs. And so one of the tools which many Americans have used for rising is a good job. Uh, there's a story that you, one day you find a job, and you start in the mail room, and you work your way up, and 20 or 30 years later, you get a gold watch and retire. Um, those days might be behind us, but we still understand that a job and access to income is one of the tools that Americans have historically used as a tool to achieve the American dream. And then the last tool that, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, America is known as one of the, the greatest places in the world for is education. Uh, we have the largest and one of the largest public education systems in the world. Education as a, as a means to learn new information, to connect with new people, but actually acquire real hardcore skills in, in the, the early days of America. Our education system was uh, based around an agricultural uh, society, so schools ended at two or three where folks can go and uh, help, in, help in the farm. Things have changed. We, we are primarily not an agricultural society, but we still base our system on that society. And things have to evolve. But one of the things that we do know, without an education, uh, and education is very utilitarian, it's a prerequisite uh, for, for rising in America, for achieving the American dream. These are the truisms. But one thing about truisms um, that we all know, there's probably things that make the truisms, um, the things that we uh, hang our hat on, not true. Uh, there's a truth about rising in America in the 21st century, and through these series of conversations, we hope, we hope to uncover those things. And, and by uncovering those things, that we can address some of the root problems that prevent many Americans from achieving the American dream today. So I have the pleasure of introducing two very old friends of mine, uh, who I've met uh, on, on different occasions, uh, who run incredible organizations that I uh, love, honor, and uh, respect. Um, Josh asked me not to do an introduction. I'm going to do a very quick introduction, maybe get a couple more bites in there. Uh, but as you all probably know, uh, Josh is the Nicholas president of the uh, Boys and Girls Club of Boston. Uh, and, and some of you who, who did know, Josh actually started a club. He was one of the core founders of the Chelsea Club um, uh, in Chelsea. He was one of the, the first leaders of that institution uh, coming, coming to bear. Um, he has a degree from Harvard uh, in social policy and from the Graduate School of Education. Uh, he was the founding executive director of the club that he helped start in Chelsea. <laughs> a long, long, long history uh, of service volunteerism in our community. Uh, he currently serves on the board of Julie's Learning Center, um, South Boston, Harvard Pilgrim uh, Healthcare Foundation. He's an overseer of the Museum of Science. Uh, and little, some of you know that he is a volunteer soccer, which you might think he might be, but he's also a basketball coach, which is actually pretty surprising. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to thank uh, Josh for being here today and sharing some of his experience, and uh, welcome, Josh. Um, our, our next guest in this conversation is welcome. Is Dave Shapiro, and I've had the pleasure of knowing Dave for a long time, and, uh, and actually um, uh, had the honor of being a board member of the, the last organization uh, that Dave served and really built into a, an institution in our state, and that's the Mass Metric Partnership. Uh, Dave currently serves as the CEO of Mentor, which is the parent umbrella organization of all the statewide mentoring programs, uh, partnerships uh, across the country. Uh, Dave is currently on the board of. 
uh, Friends of the Children of Boston, an organization I've heard of, that <laughs> had a good leader who now works somewhere else. Uh, he's a recipient of a Monza Excellent Leadership Award by Mentor. He served as a, uh, he was a bar fellow where he did a sabbatical this summer in Haiti. And he was recently, maybe three years ago, named by the Boston Build Business Journal, uh, 40 under 40. Uh, so if you guys could put your hands together and welcome them on to you. So in the, in the spirit of the, 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 uh, these conversations, um, and Brittany uh, laid the groundwork on why we have them in our kitchen, uh, why we don't have them in a conference room, why we don't have them in a restaurant, uh, why we have chicken soup. The idea is that these are comfort conversations, these are honest conversations, these are conversations that you might have with your your parents. Back in, back in um, when I was a kid, I remember waking up in the morning and my parents would drink their folders coffee and smoke their cigarettes and the ashtray that I made them for my third grade project. You guys remember when we used to make ashtrays for our parents uh, to use your, use your fingers for the, the cigarette holders. And so these were very, these were these conversations in which uh, many of us learned about uh, the world and had honest conversations. Um, there were times when you got in trouble in those conversations and there were times where your fondest memories. And so thank you for joining us in this kitchen conversation. We invite you to participate in the conversation. I have the same five questions that I asked our last guest, Mel and Newby. Um, as they arise, I, I probably will not go in the order of the questions that I ask. But if you feel compelled to ask a question or comment, we ask you to, to join in and, and participate in the conversation. You know, part of us being in a circle is that everyone's invited into the conversation. So it's not a conversation between myself and Josh and David, but rather a conversation with our community as we uncover the truth about rising in America. So the first question, I'm just going to throw it out there, and uh, whoever uh, feels compelled to ask, please jump in. Um, we all face pivotal moments um, in, in our journey to, to achieve the American dream. We call it rising in America. Can you think about two or three uh, critical moments uh, in your pursuit of the American dream uh, that have shaped uh, the direction that, that you want? Well, first of all, as you mentioned, I'm an assistant. Maybe I'd be a head coach if I could rise. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even think I could get over the phone books over there. But um, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that education is part of rising. Because I always like to say when I speak about my personal experience, um, I, I can think of one crucial moment of rising for me. I like to say that I grew up on the mean, pretty streets of Chestnut Hill. <laughs> I didn't have to rise above much. I had, uh, fortunate enough to have a great education uh, at uh, Harvard and Williams College before that. But I, I tell everybody that the greatest educational experience of my life will be um, till, uh, till you know, whenever is um, I started working <clears throat> with, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, at-risk kids in South Boston, middle school kids who were failing out of school, getting arrested. And, and those first two weeks in September of 1990, I saw firsthand, you know, things I'd only heard about. Truancy, substance abuse, teen crime, everything and anything that uh, you probably are all well aware of those issues. So, here yeah, I'd only heard about it my whole life. I'd never seen them. So, firsthand, I saw it. And at the same time, I saw that the power of relationships and mentoring at the Boys and Girls Club creates in these kids resilience so that they can rise. And then... The second thing was the 15 years I got to spend at Chelsea. No matter where I, what I do personally, professionally in my life, after my family, my nuclear, my extended family, there's no place or that means more to me or had a greater impact than the people, the businesses, families, generations worth that I met at Chelsea. They uh, really impacted me and many of those lessons I carry to this day. But I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, so when, uh, first of all, you know, Doing anything surrounding food is obviously something that comes very natural to me. <laughs> in the Shapiro tradition, you eat one meal and talk about the next one while you're eating that one. <laughs> what are we doing for lunch while we're eating? <laughs> so, uh, so we'll talk about what we're doing for dinner if there's any lull in any conversation. I'm already thinking about it. But uh, you know, I think you know, similar to similar to Josh. Um, so I don't believe that much in tipping point moments, as much as there is sort of Malcolm Gladwell has popularized this notion that there's these critical junctures. I think 
the thing I love about mentoring and find most truthful about mentoring, and I find mentoring just be one of many things, there's also a million ways to define it. I think when you're sort of a zealot for one thing, you're missing out on the human condition, which is about a lot of things. But the thing I do love about mentoring is that, um, you know, mentoring is about just like a collection of experiences and a longitudinal relationship. So there are these many moments when I can think of the first person when the first time I heard somebody say that they got somewhere all by themselves and how they were leveraging that statement and what it meant about other people and how, how you know, not truthful that seemed about my own experience and how really not truthful it felt the person who was saying it too and the way they were using it. Um, even though it was much more true about them than me, it still didn't, it still didn't seem all that true to me. And it seemed like a way to you know, divide rather than unite. And um, so I think, you know, there are those moments. There are those moments when, you know, I can remember the first time. So golf. So weirdly enough, golf's a sport I grew up, you know, resenting. Um, that's, I was raised in a liberal household where the thought was that golf was all about country clubs and about everything that was bad in the world. And, you know, when you're a kid, the thing that gets done for you that's kind of neat is everything gets put in its place. You know, and, and so it's your job as you get older to figure out whether it's in the place you want. That's the gift and the huge burden we give to our children is to put everything in a place for them. So golf was put in a place for me as a, as a thing that was just for privileged people to close everybody out. Well, you know, my first job out of college, weirdly enough, totally strange, was to work in a foundation that was using golf to advance the lives of economically disadvantaged kids, the most foreign notion I could ever imagine. <laughs> but when I stepped on a golf course in New Haven, Connecticut, you know, with a young girl who was about 12 years old, who was very overweight, who was having the first athletic success that she'd ever had in her life because golf was a sport that had gotten her out and gotten her to do that, it was the first for me unpacking of whatever it takes. There's too many challenges that all kids, all families, all people are facing for us to decide that that doesn't work and this does. And so life for me has been about basically showing me every day that I don't know anything. I really don't. I don't know anything about your experience. I don't know anything about how you got to where you are. I know that when you say certain things like, I got where I am by myself, you know, or I overcame all these odds, I know there's something to that and I want to know what it means. But I also know that when we make overarching statements about the moment when it all changed, it, uh, you know, it's, it's not true. It happened little by little. We're all looking for like a silver bullet and I'm not sure it's a convergence of lots of things. The one other thing I would say, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, is the, the thing that I do love about mentoring is that often it is moments in our city that make us go do things for other people. So an example of that is um, when a young man, you know, was shot on the basketball court at Bromley Heath a lot of people rushed to Bromley Heath, you know, to be there with kids. And I remember a young man I was mentoring, you know, and still am, Keate, saying to me, in sort of the innocence of a kid, like, everybody's having dinners for us and stuff. Like, he didn't really know why. Was, all these folks were coming around, but they were clergy, other folks. I mean, it was great. I mean, it was, it was the support of a community. But what I saw in the folks that, the mentors that were there, that, you know, big brother, big sister had worked to have there, and I was one of them, was that we already had relationships. Right. So like I picked up Keontae on a Saturday morning just like I would any other morning. We didn't talk about what happened, you know, to Juwan. We did not talk about that. But about three times later he said, you know, in just the course of conversation, what's it mean to, you know, be a man and if you're not the one doing the shooting, you're the one getting shot. And it became a conversation that lasted maybe seven minutes. It wasn't like a critical moment. It was but it, it was three times later. And everyone who just came there in the heat of the moment, I'm guessing they never had that conversation. Because when you come to kids in the heat of the moment, you're not meeting them where they're at. When you mentor people, you meet them where they're at because you're in an ongoing thing. And then just David just nailed that. And uh, just an experience we had at our organization. A kid a couple of Mays ago that was shot on a scooter. He probably, some of you probably heard the story. might know the families. I don't know. Uh, the kid was a regular member of our Dearborn Club. And a group that's probably a group this big that were that was their crew or their, their buddy system. And uh, so one of the kids came to speak to our board because, you know, we did some stuff. And that's what David just said is what he said in his remarks to our board. He said, 
you know, when this young man, Nicholas, was shot and killed in cold blood over stupidity, he said, he said, you know, everybody came up. Politicians, this one, that one, TV, did it, did it. Because the only ones that were there before, during, and what I know will be there after will be the Boys and Girls Club. And he didn't mean, I would, you know, he meant Josh Davis, the staff, and Big Mike, the staff, and yeah. Miss D, the staff. That, that's what he meant. And that's what he said. And he said, basically, just paraphrase what David just said. So, okay. nope, no will just share just before we head further on. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I know. No, that's, the, that's the thing that's right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, you know, you mentioned where you grew up and where you went to school. And since we all have origins and stuff, and, okay, where did you grow up? Because I detect a little bit of a sudden. Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> I guess yeah, no, it's wrong. <laughs> Nashville, for example. Yeah. Okay. yeah, no, I, I'm from Baltimore. Um, oh, you are? Yeah. Woo! Oh, Woo! A-W-M-E-R, if you're trying to come to Baltimore. Baltimore. Um, I'm, I'm from Baltimore, um, and uh, I grew up in a neighborhood called Mount Washington in the okay. city, northwest, northwest corner of Baltimore. North west. Yeah, north. Yeah. So north of Towson. Right? Yes. Where my husband grew up. There you go. Okay. Very near Pimlico Racetrack, where yes. the Preakness is. is our claim it. to fame. I used to love guys' kegs on Preakness Day, and later I drank out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Loved them in a wheelbarrow. I made a lot of money on on uh, Um And education, not that. Okay, I, I, you know, I have really mixed feelings about this. Because, oh yes, yeah. because there. But but where you went to school sure. sort of identifies certain cultural things. Yeah. So I went to basically the same school as him. The people with no problems who hated each other. I went to Amherst College, the okay. Bible Williams. <laughs> yeah. um, and people, again, people had so few challenges that they could yeah. be mad at each other. Um, but, uh, so, and I, I majored in political science and, and English, so yeah. I was prepared to do virtually nothing. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think we're not doing anything. I just have to jump in, sorry, but yeah, I was going to do, I was a history major, so I see the major. I was going to do art history as well, and then I had to rise above it because they required a drawing class. <laughs> Yeah, and I played football and baseball at, at Amherst, which was a big part of my experience because I think... Um, what position did you play? I played center. Very, ah. very glamorous. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm always telling my kids the smartest smartest guy on the football field is the center. I'm not sure by that. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was interesting to be, a, to, be, to be an athlete in Amherst, which was, you know, I had come from a tradition where being kind of like a renaissance person kind of doing everything was um, the ideal and I fit into that so it worked real well um, and then at Amherst uh, for a variety of reasons the biggest guys on campus were okay guys to target like that was sort of like they were the one not protected class I mean they, every, everybody was fine I mean they, no one wanted for anything in Amherst town it's as devoid from reality as any place on earth but it was okay to run okay. like the football and the hockey players are me heads and they didn't get in here on their own merits. Like, you could write that. You couldn't write that about anybody else. That's right. But you could write that about the football and hockey players. So it was the first moment where I felt like, man, that's not, doesn't really feel okay. fair, you know? Yeah. Um, and I had never felt that in my life. At the same time, I it started to get me to dig into people's BS about this notion of, like, getting somewhere on their own. Who are you putting down so that you feel up? Like, it was just, you know, it was... It was an interesting laboratory for that, you Absolutely. know. Um, Absolutely. And so, just a notion of belonging and looking for reasons why, you know, someone's better than another. I probably experienced more at Amherst, actually, even though it's so not the real world again, than I did growing up in Baltimore, yep. where it was just like we were a member of the community, and I didn't see it as much, you know. I yep. just didn't see it as much. So, thank you. Awesome. Sorry thank for you. my bad. No, no, no. That's really well. Thank you. Um, I think I'm real interested in people talk about success and talk about mentoring. A lot of times you're looking for mentors that have a certain amount of success, and so the kids begin to look at success as being something that you arrive at or some material thing. Uh, but I think the real learning, you might get a comment on this, is that if we begin to talk more about our failures along the way, I think we'll be able to help kids a lot more. I don't know if you experience that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There, there's a great there's a great article that I, I can never put my finger exactly on what it was, but probably y'all know it and have it on your fingertips. But 
there was this article in the New York Times in like their education edition that was doing an education pullout thing a few months ago. You know, it was all about grit. Yeah, yeah it was all about grit, and and it was about um, that. And I can't remember. There were so many smart things in this article. The Institute at Penn, and it was comparing actually like a kick school and a prep school, Rivers, I think, in New York, and about how we have this like values oriented education, but we're not teaching kids about grit right. and how to overcome failure. Yeah. And uh, and so I don't know what, I guess I don't have a appropriate answer to your question except to say I agree, and it was a great piece about it. Yeah, and I, said, and I guess I would uh, really just sum it up by saying no matter if it's a mentoring relationship, a relationship with our wife, partner, our kids, if you don't have honesty in a relationship, then it's not a real relationship. You have to say, you know, you have to be honest. Like, yeah, I screwed this up because of it, and I, this is what I took from it, and, you know, I think. And I think to the mentoring relationship, and we've got some mentoring expertise in the room, one, one of the things that does happen all the time with mentors, and uh, mentoring programs take a lot of different different things, but mentors are always trying to figure out, so just like parents actually, so I just heard about a failure, or I just heard about a bad thing, what do I do now? You know, And one of the best things mentoring programs that have great match support do is say, Stick with it. You know what I mean? Like, don't don't push that child away. That that child has people to tell him or tell her. Here's the consequence. It's wrong. You shouldn't embrace it. You shouldn't say it's right. But you should just listen and stick with it. And if mentors can be non-judgmental friends and supporters that meet people where they at, then they're the best we got in humanity. I mean, because as as I think wives and husbands, partners, we're trying to be those people. But uh, yeah, I agree with you. And a lot of I would say a lot of youth programs are. You know, set up very much around rewarding success and not as much about working through failure. I mean, I just think it's what we do. Um, you know, I think it's also about some of the judgments we make about the home and whether there's structure there and whether there's cause and effect and their their pretentious assumptions that we make about what a child needs. I mean, I think I, I'm not saying like I'm not incriminating. There's tons of great programs, but we do set them all up that way. How do you feel about uh, the cross gender, cross culture metric. I mean, I was raised, my mom and dad were both present. But I had four sisters and a mom. If I can guarantee you one thing, I know how to work with women. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, I spent all my time here. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of the question. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I really don't have it. If you're honest, and this is one person's opinion again, if you're honest and you have an honest relationship with someone, None of that stuff, in my opinion, should matter. I mean, if you're meeting a kid, as David was saying, you meet kids where they're at, and if you're doing it in an honest, consistent, genuine way, I would think you can get beyond that. That stuff doesn't matter. And most of the research does show that that stuff, you know, that doesn't matter as much, that closeness can be formed much more quickly. If there are some common identities and some common interests and some commonalities, there are also a lot of families that are in search of something, you know, that are in search of a man or in search of a woman right. for a, a reason, you know, uh, an absence or, um, you know, to provide sort of if you can't see it, you can't be it. And so I think there are some families that say, well, there's the absence of this in my family or my community and this is a way to get it in. But I, I don't think there's anything that says it doesn't work. But, but a lot of times it is what people are seeking out, especially in communities. I mean, we've got some volume issues. You know, a lot of times people think mentoring is about me making a commentary that there's an absence of something and it needs to be inserted. It's not. It's supposed to be additive. It's not supposed to be a replacement. But we do have a volume problem in America. The way we lock up certain kinds of people, the way we deal with certain things, we've got communities where we've got just volume issues. We've got you know, eight boys to every one man. And we've got, you know, we just got issues where it's not an organized, it's not an ecosystem organized the way we like it. Everybody's working three jobs. Like it's, it's just about the finite numbers. It's not about values. And, you know, but I do, I do worry sometimes that somehow we feel like it's a commentary on something that's missing and that someone else, some other matter from the heavens paternalistically has to deliver from the mean streets of Chestnut Hill, you know, which is not. No, I agree. It's got to be a way to talk about it. And an example around your point, as well as what we were just saying, you know, we have a, 
at our Jordan Club. I remember when I was still working in Chelsea, so about eight years ago, a guy came, he's in his early 70s, and just lost his wife, looking for something to do, and I'm sure all of us that are working on profits, we always get eager volunteers, and a lot of the time it dies out. So he said, look, I want to come in and work with kids. So seven, eight years ago, he's been in religiously two to three days a week. Uh, his closest relationship is with a, Port a whole Puerto Rican family. The kid, that kid was on scholarship at Syracuse, academic. He would drive. They didn't have a car, so every September, load up the car with all the kids' stuff, drive up with the mother and friends, drop, do the same thing, pick up. He also uh, is very close with a Somalian young man who they stay in touch talks to the family. So really, I know they go to him for advice, for guidance, or on certain things, and he's still there. He's not, he was there yesterday. So. One of the one of the really interesting things that I've I've sort of seen recently with older kids that I'm excited about that I think changes that paradigm a little bit. I'm not sure if it works for younger kids, but there's this idea of youth initiated mentoring, yeah. and there's a there's an evidence based <laughs> program that actually the National Guard, interestingly enough, has to some degree been involved in around residential and system involved kids. But it's the idea of teaching a young person, and again, a person, young person got to be old enough, I think, although I think you'll probably teach some of these school skills early. There's this guy, Steve, I can't think of his last name right now, up at Cornell, that's done research on youth development that defines some kids as mentor magnets. Yeah. They know how to magnetically get you know people to them. Right. And some of that's probably nurture, some of that's probably nature, just like everything. <laughs> but this program, you know, why I am youth-initiated youth mentoring, it teaches kids how to inventory who's in their lives and find the right mentor. Then it still does what the best of mentoring does in terms of screening and matching and making sure you're in for the right relationship. It doesn't just leave them to their own devices. These are young people not in school, not in jobs. So they are one of the 6.2 million disconnected youth. So their situation is not fantastic. But it takes an asset-based approach. It says you've got people that are willing to be your mentor. And I just think that's really, it's an interesting it's an interesting tool of empowerment and paradigm shift. I really like what it says about what you know that form of mentoring can be. Um, so, so yeah. I'll just say that um, uh, that really resonates because having um, one of you say about parent mentoring being a lot like parenting. Okay, I mean you know I'm all in with that because and I'll actually say go go beyond that and say that I think. Okay, it's about 50-50 women and men. Women agree with this statement. Guys all go, you are so foolish. <laughs> okay, but I actually think parenting styles, parenting methodology is applicable in the workplace. Okay, my best management techniques come from authentic validation by parenting. Okay, stuff that works as a parent typically works in the workplace <laughs> with your peers. Okay. Um, because it's got to be respectful, it's got to be generative, it's got to actually get something done, right? Okay, so so using that analogy, um, the youth initiated mentoring, I saw this a ton in the lovely public school system that my kids happen to be the beneficiary. So just since we're all telling which town we came from, um, 22 years ago, my husband and I moved to Lexington. Okay, as a middle class family, we can't afford it. God forbid something happened to our house, we couldn't move back to Lexington now, okay? It's way above our <coughs> So we just hang on. Us and our neighbors, we all hang together. <laughs> we just want to keep living here. But there's a lot of examples of youth initiated mentoring from first grade, okay? So reading, and we all know about the importance of, of reading to other people as a way of increasing sophistication of language skills and literacy. Okay. So at the elementary school that these kids went to, the third graders read to the first graders, and the fifth graders read to the third graders, okay? Because, and, and it was a different kind, and it was a buddy system. I mean, my kids actually knew the kids in the older grades because of that. And it was less, I perceive there to be less bullying and more respect, because if you authentically know a kid in that grade, they're not going to treat you like a thing, they're going to treat you like a person. Right? Yeah. So, so I think that kind of youth initiated, and, and it, that's that. There's a whole lot of examples. We're not a lot of it in Boston for whatever weird reasons. Oh, my daughter went to college on the West Coast. It's youth. There's so many examples of like um, Tennessee, and at a time where it was rising, definitely 
right of view is rise. And um, I think peer mentoring, you know, learning from each other, tribal learning, tribal leadership in our kids' generation is huge. It's a one half thing that we're not recognizing. Okay. Question. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> part of rising is being able to relate to each other across our lines of difference. You, you two are from. I think you're from a nice neighborhood in Baltimore too. You say Chestnut Hill. If if I'm from a different kind of neighborhood and me relating to you requires me to understand, you need to understand the tapes that are in my head from where I grew up, and I need to understand the tapes that are in your head where you grew up, what are some things that you could offer from where you grew up that you're carrying with you that I need to know to be able to relate to you well, in, in a good way? I, and I hate in your first name? Frankie. Frankie. Uh, I, and I, again, like I simplified the point about a rep. To me, um, relating to anyone is just as Dave was saying too, when you, when you meet someone where they're at, I think it's true respect, you know, just respecting a person, hearing a person, and I don't know if I say validating, but um, I think meeting a person where they're at, and I guess from my background, I just, I guess understanding, uh, frankly, this sets up, all right, uh, I remember <clears throat> throughout high school and then when I started doing the work I did back in the early 90s, People would get back to me and say, you know, you don't act like a rich kid. So I'd be like, oh, all right, thanks, you know. And I, <laughs> I don't know. And I remember talking to my dad about it. And I'll tell you, I learned from my parents, I think this is the, the be all and end all. You treat everybody with respect. Doesn't matter what they do, who they are, what they've done in their life, good or bad. You treat them all and you learn from everybody. That's the thing. I learn from anyone and everyone. I don't care what they are or who they are, a CEO to anybody. The, you know, the lowest on the So I remember talking to my dad. I said, they said, uh, it's funny you don't act like it. And I guess the thing is, the people who come from privileged backgrounds don't think that we're just going to be like, oh, this is all you got me for lunch, you know, that kind of stuff. Or, you know, please hang up my coat for me, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, I guess that's it. But, but then again, that might just be my insecurity, and you ain't my shrink, so I don't know. <laughs> I'm honestly, that, you know, when people say you don't act like a... And I, I understand what they're saying, I do, but I know the way I was raised in my house is, it doesn't matter, you learn from that. You're stupid if you don't take the opportunity to learn from that. Like, then you're being stupid. Yeah, I think my... I just feel... I mean, I just really do travel the world feeling lucky. I mean, that's really the tape in my head, I guess. I mean, that's what my, I mean, I know, like, from the day I was born, it was ovarian lottery. So from there, it's like, what do you do with that? I mean, seriously, I, mean, I don't, it's not that I, it's not that I think that financial means, you know, get you out of, of pressure. It's not about finances. It's about the lack of stressors that were in my life. I never heard my parents discuss you know, how they were going to make it the next day. They never discussed that. I never heard job insecurity. You know, they got divorced. I heard insecurity of relationship. You know, I saw alcoholism. But I never saw the insecurity of my own condition. I was never worried for the next day. I never worried about how we were going to pay for college. There was no stress put on my shoulders. So I feel like it's my job, and maybe this is wrong, but I feel like it's my job to not have any case plan in my head. What the hell do I have to, I should be able to meet people where they're at. You know, I, I do, I see differences. You know, I'm incredibly trusting because the minute I walk into a room, usually my voice has always been valued in my life from the minute I was born. So when I've met other people and worked with other people who are distrustful or who seem, you know, maybe overly proud or they don't just wake up in the morning wanting to run through walls to the boss, I get that that comes from a place where their voice hasn't always been valued, but my voice has. So the more I can remove me from the equation, I've got no right to be offended. You know, I always love when people say like, you could have been doing anything. You're doing this, you're doing the Lord's right. I mean, I, this is what I want to be doing. Right. Screw you. I, I didn't have, <laughs> I, I was lucky enough to, to get out of college with no loans. I could take a $20,000 job. I mean, it just keeps going. The decisions I was afforded to make. They never came because I'm some great guy. They came because all the way up, I was totally free to make whatever decision I wanted to make. 
I've had free will my entire life. Imagine what that, you know, how lucky you are. And so I think other people are going to carry some baggage, and I'm sure I have some too, but I feel like the tape in my head is remove the baggage for luck. You know, so. You, you guys are making my job a, a lot easier. I bet, I think, Brittany or Damon $5 that I would get through three questions, but this is actually better than I expected. So, uh, I'm gonna, Leora has a question over here. Um, I have two questions, actually. My first question is if you can each define what you mean by meeting people where they're at, because it's a phrase that I think, you know, everybody has a different interpretation of. Um, that's my first question. And the second question is to walk with your question a little bit. How, um, I guess, I don't know how to phrase this question, but what do you think the responsibility is of mentors to have strong knowledge and institutional privileges? So race, class, gender, and how do we prepare our mentors? Like, I don't think, I think mentorship is something everybody can do, but I, I also don't at the same time because, you know, part of meeting for me, at least, like meeting people where they're at, it's also they're meeting me where I'm at too. I guess then, because you know I'm working on stuff and they're working on stuff, and I think that we both have knowledge to impart to each other. And sometimes, as a mentor, you're you're also an educator, so you have even there's another layer of responsibility that you should be kind of, you know, you're you're trying to navigate like all these worlds, and particularly your own world in terms of self reflection on your life and and institutional structures, societies. Well, meeting people where they're at, don't patronize, listen, genuinely listen. Don't hear, listen, ask questions, learn about them. You know, selfishly, you're going to learn something about them that might help you, but it's also going to create a bond, a relation, a mutual respect. And so, that's in my vision. Your second question, I guess, um, uh, I guess apply. Uh, and can you actually, Leora, do you mind rephrasing it? Just so, so you're saying, if you're, how do you take into effect all your personal things and relate it to some? I, I might not have understood. No, no, it's because it's not. I'm having trouble formulating it as a question because to me it's more like just a personal opinion. It's like I feel as a say it as a personal opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any great wisdom. Say it. Share some wisdom with you. No, like I feel as a white woman that I need to understand white privilege, that I need to understand gender privileges, that I need to understand my class privilege, uh, that I need to have a greater understanding on how every how institutions affect all of us, you know, and, and it's constantly reevaluating my own privilege because I think too like at least in my job as a mentor, I work with my youth to become critical thinkers. You know, I want them to understand how your place in society and how other people I want them to understand power. Um, so therefore I need to have an understanding of power how power works. Um, and what powers I have, and everybody has privileges, and everybody has, you know, everybody has that. But it's also what are the intersections, you know, I, I don't know, it's just, I think that there should, like, be some type of mandate that you have to understand white privilege as a white person working with youth of color. You have to understand class privilege, you have to, under, or at least be open to understanding. I don't know if there's ever, like, a level that you reach, but just, like, this constant reflection and evaluating your own life. What do you want to say? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I find that statement real interesting. Um, just for our background, I mean, I grew up in public health, or I grew up in Stanford, Connecticut. I mean, usually when people hear Stanford, Connecticut, they think of wealth, okay? I grew, grew up in public housing in Stanford, Connecticut. Had a chance to go off to boarding school to the UC program, much like the government. And years later, uh, I had a young man visit me in Boston, uh, because he grew up next door to a star basketball player going northeastern. I bought him by the house and I said, well, listen, you know, you got to live in here if you don't go back there. It would be, there would be in a bad place. But how bad could it be? I, I was from there. You know, so yeah. I think the key is, with all this and mentoring, all that doesn't matter if you're being authentic. Okay. You know, yes. it's, it's the authenticity that really matters. I mean, uh, you know, I, I had, White gentleman that helped me uh, get connected to the 
ABC program because he was friends with the dean that ran the program. Uh, my high school guidance counselor grew up in the projects where I grew up, so you know, then he went out successful. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, wh why are you really doing this? You know, it, it, what do you, how can you help? As opposed to, well, I have the, I'm a woman, I have, I, I have status. All that doesn't matter. If you're honest, I mean, the kids, if you ever put a little kid in a room and put some bad people in a room and put some good people, watch where they gravitate. Yeah, <laughs> the, kid, the kids have radar better than we do. You know, so I don't know. I, I, I find the two questions you asked for me very interconnected. But, you know, but this is the way I approach it. And, you know, and, and awareness is a hard thing. But I will tell you that mentors that are community based mentors that are willing to become a part of the home, bring children to their own home. You know, I, I get a lot of awareness. Like, I, I couldn't have read anything. I couldn't have gotten any training than the 20 years that I've walked into people's homes and picked up their children and that they've trusted me to go spend time. And that I've listened to what those children observe about my life and I've thought about what I observe about. I mean, walking out of any place, any home I've ever mentored a child, there's always been a pretty poignant thought. Sometimes heartbreaking, sometimes triumphant, sometimes mundane. And the only thing that I try to like subsume is the notion that somehow I am the great white hope there to help. You know, that's the only thing. That's the only white power, you know, privilege thing is that I am the helper in this situation. I don't feel like the helper. I want to be with the you know. I've been with a four and seven year old all day. I'm kind of psyched about <laughs> keeping it real with a 13 year old for a little while. I mean, I, I, he enriches my life, you know, and I really, it doesn't make sound drag sometimes, all that kind of stuff, but I, I view it as a privilege to be with him, you know, and I don't view myself as like, I'm coming in to help these poor folks, you know, I mean, I think that you have to get out of your head. But other than that, mentoring to me is the most authentic point of meeting people where they're at if you really do it in the most authentic way. So if you fill your head with a bunch of academia about privilege and power, yeah. I just think you're gonna come with preconceived mm -hmm. notions that don't allow you to be yeah, real to that person. You're gonna be trying to make up for hundreds of years of history, which I don't pretend to think I'm trying to make up for hundreds of years of history. Yeah. I don't know. So, yeah, and I don't, just to, sorry, sorry, just to follow on Bill's point, it, uh, if, if you're authentic, authenticity wins out over whatever your background is, wherever you come from, whatever your freaking, yeah. or you wouldn't have, you lose all your freaking because you're authentic, you're in the moment with that person. When you're in the moment with someone, that's when we're, we're real relationships. Let's, let's go with Bill and then, and then Connie. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's a really helpful exchange, and I, and I, and I buy a lot of it. I think one of the interesting things about this rising conversation America for me is that one of the dimensions of privilege in this country is that as you, is if you are in a position of privilege, um, as you rise, your community can stay intact. And if you're not, as you rise, you have to leave your community. And that's true of poor people, people of color, and immigrants in this, in this country. And, and so one of the, I guess if I was in a mentoring environment, believing, I think a lot of it is, is you guys believe it, in terms of being authentic, I'm just curious about kind of how the differences, frankly, and different difference in tapes plays out, right? Because it really is different. There are a lot. There are probably many, maybe hundreds of little choices that are made to rise, which mean you're leaving someone behind. And so I'm just wondering how that, if that comes up, or if you experience that in, in work in your life. Um, so, sorry, I'm going to do this to you again. <laughs> yeah, so, the toast lunch. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, uh, I don't know, my, uh, the, whatever. The, uh, so you're asking if when we have in, in, Dave in and I have risen, who have we left? Oh, no, in, in, in relationship, right? Yeah. I guess I'm asking you to reflect. Right, right. right now, about your path to rise, in which I'm, I'm making an assumption that you've been you've been able to stay to keep your community relatively intact as you rise, right? And right. My community being my friends, my the friends, family, your family, okay. the people that support right. you, the people that right. are around gotcha. you. Um, that's a significantly different condition than the condition that 
to succeed, you need to lead your friends, lead your family, right. lead the people that are in your community. And oftentimes I find we're giving people advice to do that. So that's that's oh, heavy yeah. stuff. Like that's a heavy when we haven't done it ourselves. If we when we haven't done it ourselves. Right. 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 I think it's really hard for us to understand well, the power that's embedded in those choices if we haven't had to make those choices. Right, well, it's directly relational to Bill's point, right? Yeah. You don't want to go back there. Right. And how, many, how many yeah. of those messages get spun out? And yeah, so if we haven't experienced it ourselves, it seems to me it's going to be hard to appreciate the choices well, that you're asking. For. Then what I do is I go back to what David said at the very beginning off of Amari's first question when he said that, uh, you know, mentoring or rising comes through a series of. I mean, this wasn't his exact words, so again, he was pregnant, but, you know, events that happen throughout an extended period of time. So, if we're in one of our clubhouses and a staff has a strong relationship with a kid, and they're starting to build it, right away, they're not saying, you know, you've got to move out of the central lab projects. You just, you'll never go anywhere. You know, through time, they're modeling, they're supporting, they're consistently showing themselves to that person, the kid, giving the kid you know, maybe baby steps to make decisions on their own, where it's coming from an internal source, not an external source. And that's really, I think, what true mentoring is. So if you're letting people come to decisions on their own, then really that's their experience. And maybe, uh, like Bill said, maybe coming back is it? Maybe they go away to school, come back, and do something else. I heard you, it's a short time. Does that, time? did you? I, I did. I, I was lucky enough to have a big sister in third grade. and. I think so. Josh keeps uh, kind of knocking this out the ballpark, probably the wrong the fault. So I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 well, sorry, but, <laughs> um, but told you how much I know this way. Um, but I have to say that the one thing that she didn't, she was Jewish, and the one thing that she didn't, she just listened, and she showed up every single week, yeah. and that was enough. And I made mistakes. I got pregnant at 14, and and she came and she picked me up, and we talked about that. But she also exposed me. And so leaving my community, she did that. That I don't think that's what she was encouraging, but she, what she was encouraging was education and exposure and saying, I know you think that this is it, that this is your world, but I'm just going to show you a little bit more, and maybe your choices will be different. And so I think that um, just again, I think just showing up sometimes is just enough. And so I would just say that naively, my because it hasn't been my life story. My focus as a professional and as a person is to get capital and assets into neighborhoods so the paradigm isn't that you have to escape them. I know that's the reality people are living. I'm lucky enough that I'm not living that, so I'm not looking to escape my neighborhood. But I would never, like I would never, if a, if a young person came to that reality on their, on their own, I would be supportive of it. I would try to show them the world, but I would never use their neighborhood as a leverage point to escape. Now, I also realize that's a very real motivator for people. And, and again, I didn't experience this. It's a very real motivator to try to escape. And I think it's all of our jobs, you know, to create an America where it's not about escaping somewhere. I mean, I had that conversation this morning with someone who works at Stepping Stone, you know, which is a program that basically takes kids out of the Boston public schools and puts them in exams in private schools. And, like, if I were a parent... I would love to find Stepping Stone. I don't begrudge a single parent who wants to get their kid into Stepping Stone. I wish Stepping Stone wasn't needed. I wish we weren't all looking for an escape from the Boston public schools, but I don't begrudge someone who wants to find one. So, I want a, a, a comment from Connie, a comment from Mike, and then I'm behind you. A comment from Denise, and then, and then I'm gonna let our speakers um, have, have the last word. Yeah, and I think this is a parallel and you know, sort of the reverse side maybe of what Bill's saying and incorporating a little for us, which is, you know, all you said about, you know, mentoring and the one-on-one -on -one relationship is extremely important. And of course, you know, what you just said about injecting capital and assets into the community addresses some of the issues. When, when do we go, or when does a mentor, if they ever, go from the sense of this is a service that I'm providing to this child, authentic as the relationship may be, to help that one single person rise above versus getting the sense of moral outrage, if you will, when they begin to see that, you know what, it is not enough for me to just go three times a week to Bromley Heath. It, it, it affects my politics, it affects, it encourages me and helps me to talk to my neighbors in my community in Chestnut Hill about, you know, the choices they're making, which are 
uh, which are creating, <laughs> if we have to be honest, some of the conditions that are in Boston. Yeah. And so that's one. And then, you know, the relation to uh, what you're saying is, and I think, you know, this is the model of Boston Rising, that is not about one-on-one. -on -one. It's not about one agency doing something versus another. Where does that system, right, <laughs> we were talking about earlier, where does that system get into play so that, you know, I know that, you know, I may be mentoring you, but, you know, if you're pregnant, here are, like, the 15 other services that, you know, you can access and your family can access so that we're... And, and build from there. I mean, I, yeah, go ahead. I would think uh, I'll start with the second question. Speaking for Boys and Girls Club, whether they be part of our organization or other ones, I would hope that I think it's a staff's responsibility to know, okay, if a kid comes in with this, this, or this, or a family comes in, that they know resources in the community is something to them. I mean, maybe it's as simple as that. So one of the things, we speak about a Boys and Girls Club to Boston is we can't do, we're all, all of us, nonprofits as well as for profits we're all in the same boat. We want to push community forward. So we have to work together. And there's ways to work together. You know, one of the things with for profits we say is it's not just give us money, it's, you know, how can we support you and your employees? They come in and volunteer. We can send kids to intern. We can, we can do gift drives for our kids. So, we did, and then with nonprofits, it's essential. You know, whether when Dave was at Mass Mentoring or Mario was at Friends, it's important to us as an organization. We have to partner. That's why we will connect. And uh, so that was that. And then the first question, and I don't, again, I want to simplify. I think sometimes, and uh, Tanya, thanks for what you said, I think sometimes we overthink, like, Okay, I'm going to come in and save Amar. I mean, if you think like that, no, but if you think like that, I, you shouldn't be working. You should be doing something else. It's like, you know what? I'm going to go in every day. My job is the education director at the Yankee Club of Roxbury. So, damn but Here's my programs. Let's sit down. Our STEM program is this. Here's this. Every day, Amar, you come in every day. You know, your homework, and you start to develop those relationships with those kids. You see what's so I guess, again, it goes back to consistency, slow and steady wins the race. I, I, I do believe, though, what you said first happens. I hope it happens. I haven't seen a lot of research about it. I do think it's important, which is the moral outrage part. I don't even know if it's the moral outrage for me, because I think that's a step further and a little bit more dramatic. But I think the breaking down of otherness. I mean, I think we have a lot of, when, when Newt Gingrich, you know, regardless of your politics, and I, you know, I'm sure we've got a lot of like-minded folks in the room, so it's kind of an easy <laughs> audience, but, but again, when he says that President Obama is a welfare president, he's saying that because he thinks it's going to resonate with a lot of what the Americans think, and there are a lot of Americans who think like, you know, we have to be like, okay with figuring out how to address those people and how to deal with that. But the point is that when you walk into somebody's house and you start to build a bond with them, and whether or not they are on public assistance is the furthest thing from your mind. You're building a relationship with humans. And then later on you learn they're on public assistance. And then later on you learn what people are saying is overarching generalizations about public assistance. You will be morally outraged. Relationships with humans will make you morally outraged. And that's why some of us who are idealistic about mentoring believe that it does bind and empower our social fabric. It's not the only thing. But the more we break down otherness, the more we have a shot, I think. A fighting shot at a collective rise. I'm going to quick comment from Mike and Denise. Yeah, this is related to a, a lot of the comments we've heard, in, um, in particular to, to some you said earlier, Josh, with, with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, starting and just, you know, the poor communities waiting for the kid from Chestnut Hill to, you know, to come in and make things better. But, you know, how much of mentoring is you know, relating to people and getting on the same level versus, like, giving them permission to do well and, and allowing them to rise and telling them that they can do it and building confidence and, you know, really just giving them permission because, you know, they may come from a home where they're, mom and dad aren't telling them that they can do it and their friends aren't telling them they, they can do it and they're not demonstrating themselves that it's possible to do it. 
Um, so how much as a mentor, as someone who, who can, can give that to them, how much of it is not just relating to them, but giving them permission to be great themselves? To be who they are at their level. Yeah. Uh, that's, I think that's meeting someone where they're at. That's, you know, uh, there's a story back at the club in Chelsea when I was there that a, a social worker at the time had told me if two kids come to him and same, like within two hours, one came with letters from Division One basketball schools and he was picking the scholarship that he wanted to go to. Great day for him. A couple hours later, he brought the kid off right over here at the bus station to go to job for him when he left high school. Great day for him. So does that end? You praise both of them, yeah, praise, say this is a great decision, you know, you're lucky to have the choice to go to one of these schools, go to school for free. The other kid, you're like, this is a great move for you, because you know school wasn't working for you. Is that? I mean, the only that, other thing I would add to that, Mike, is that, and I think, you know, these guys as, as max sport guys who work in mentoring, I mean, a lot of it is showing up. Like, I mean, again, we have, we're talking about a continuum of human development, so it depends where you are, but... For a lot of kids, you know, adults are entered into their lives when something's going terribly bad or terribly well. And so if you just show up when nothing's going on, and you don't have to give them permission, that's just giving them permission because you care enough to show up no matter what's going on. I think that tells them there's innate human value to them. Yeah. If they need that from someone else, I don't think you need to do anything more than presence. True presence that's consistent and that's not based on your own need for fulfillment or something bad or good happening in their lives. Like being present, I think powerfully gives that permission would be my thought about that. I know we're running out of time. Um, yeah, no, real quick, and actually for once it's on topic for me, so. Um, I, I have this idea that, and I'm really pretty passionate about shifting the paradigm around this notion of mentoring. I think the word mentoring comes with a lot of baggage attached to it. People kind of throw all kinds of stuff under it preconceived ideas about what it means is kind of like being eco-friendly, like what does that mean? Um, that it's not the mentor coming in and fixing a problem, it's actually the opposite. For me and in the work that we've been doing over you know, the past decade, it's that we're finding these amazing, amazing people that are just there. And for whatever reason, they're surrounded by things that are pinning them back and that are holding them back. And that's the the mentorship relationship or framework is the thing that sets them free and that allows them to have access to information, have access to um, respect and to a chance to be heard and to be respected. And so we're not like the saviors swooping in and fixing a problem. We're actually trying to sort of set free a, a lot of missed opportunity. And I think if we can change the paradigm around mentoring to be a resource and a framework for positivity as opposed to putting labels on who these kids are on these communities. It shifts even the way they relate to the adult people that come in and enter their world, whether it's something going on, good, bad, or just, just sort of in their lives. So I know what you think about it. it it's, it's a big idea, but it's actually a pretty simple notion. Yeah, I mean, I think most mentoring pro programs that practice it, you know, every day, philosophically practice it in that means and would tell any mentor who comes into them and says, when they're screening them for being a mentor, if a person says, like, I want to save children, that's the first warning sign that this person is not a good mentor. I mean, I think most people say you are a tool of presence and empowerment. You are not even there to unlock what's pinning them back, to use your phraseology. You are there to be a support for the adults that are already in their lives as well, to work with them, assuming those adults are positively supporting them. You are there to believe the best of them and what's in their lives and to meet them there and be a tool of empowerment. So I think, I mean, I think mentoring actually, compared to a million other youth development strategies, is one of the most honest about being an asset-based approach rather than, you know, a, a sort of other, other sort of detriment-based or whatever the other the opposite is. It's not a punishment. No good mentoring program says you're getting a mentor because you're a bad kid. I mean, they usually, in New York City, they have an, an, an entire system-based mentoring program that is for kids who are truant. But the name of the program is New York City Success Mentors Program. You know, I mean, they're trying to change the paradigm to, road, you know, to help you be successful. So I think you're right. I just want to 
just wondering if, if this is a reciprocal relationship, what have you gotten out of mentoring? Um, for me personally, um, when I started the opportunity, and I'd say the privilege to work with kids starting in 1990 in Southie and Dorchester within my 15 years in Chelsea. I, yeah, I said, you know, beyond my new put my family, nuclear and extended. It's the most important experience in my life, whatever I go on to do personally, professionally, whatever. But when they're unplugging me from the machine, they say, well, What was your greatest experience? I'll say those years in Chelsea for 15 or 20 years. I just I don't want to say like I said before, you're not my psychiatrist, so you don't want to listen to me babble, but honestly I, I got a lot out of it. Cell phone all that stuff. I, I don't want to talk about myself, so but that's it. So it's a little general. I think for me, it's like the greatest education I've ever gotten. You know, I mean, someone give you the privilege to be a part of their life. You know, um, for no reason other than you wanted to be, and they wanted to be. Um, that's a mutual covenant where no one has an agenda, where people are just, you know, again, the, I don't know how to define with eloquent words what you asked about meeting people where they're at, and I hate that cliche too, but it is the relationship more than any other I have in my life that is like, we just show up, you know? Um, and every mentoring relationship I've ever had has been just about showing up for each other. Um, and I don't think we do enough showing up for each other. So, I mean, I'm just proud to be a part of a relationship where we show up for each other. And I try to be as good in every other relationship as I am in my mentoring relationship, because that's probably the relationship I have that has the least bullshit in it. You, know? you talk a lot about values, and um, the potentially the, I know we're, we're running late on time, I apologize. My daughter, my 14 year old daughter, told me I have a muffin top, so I can't. I eat a lot of them. No, go ahead, Alice. Is there one, and I, just, I, wanna, I know we're trying to conclude here, but in terms of values, you talked a lot about values, and I'm very intrigued by what you said. Is there a value that your mentorship relationship taught you um, that you feel is, has really shaped you? For me personally, I have to go back to. I think one of those things that I keep alluding to is that it was instilled in me by my parents, but really just you learn from everybody and their experience and, and listen and learn from everybody experience. Because you can learn that's where you learn. It's not books, it's not that's what people relationships. I think for me probably, you know, it's a lot of that and then also just the absence of judgmentalism. I mean I think we wake up, I was saying that Bill the other day, and I said it yesterday to a group of people in a seminar thing. It's like, I mean, I think we wake up every day pretty good, like humans, pretty clear minded humans, ready to take on the day, knowing that we can compromise and all that. And as the day gets on, there's just this callous effects of our egos and our BS and our insecurities. And by the end of the day, we're like 14 times less intelligent than we were when it started. And so I think the value that it sort of has taught me is just, I think every time I finish a moment in a mentoring situation, it reminds me just how purely it is about human relationship, how little I know and how wrong all my judgments are about the world. And how while it might be neat to put things in their places, it's not helping the world when you've got to put things in their places because the world ain't that order that way. So I want to thank you all for the time and, the, the, and giving us a little bit of extra time for the conversation and, and all the great participation. Believe it or not, I have 20 questions and sub-questions that I have, but I only got through one. And I, think, <laughs> and, and I really think that had a lot to do with the participation of, of, the, uh, of the group here. And, um, I think the wonderful thing about a kitchen conversation, they're never the same conversation twice, and never, they never happen the same way uh, every uh, every time that you have them um, in our in our so if you guys could please um, join me with a with a round of applause.